Cause like a winter From wherever you are around the world, welcome and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be exploring the world of learning. Are you sure you're learning the right way? We're going to find out with Dr. Barbara Oakley. She wrote this fabulous book, A Mind for Numbers. Dr. Barbara Oakley is a professor of engineering at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. She has received many awards for her teaching, including the coveted National Science Foundation New Century Scholar Award. She's also teaching on Coursera, Learning How to Learn, where she has over 500,000 students. Watch her to see how they can learn better. Let's welcome Dr. Oakley to the circle. Welcome, Dr. Oakley. Well, it's a pleasure being here. This is a great book because this is one of the things, it seems it's the hot topic in today's society. Now with Common Core coming out and everybody's focusing on learning. And so this is really interesting because you have a very unique style of teaching, especially math. Well, before we get to that and your book and why you wrote it, I wanted to know, a lot of people say, well, she was probably a math whiz her whole entire life. So were you? I wasn't. Uh, actually, I flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school in math and science. I did. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, people find it hard to believe now because I really am a professor of engineering. I've published in some of the best journals, and, and I enjoy engineering. But it wasn't always this way. I always thought, oh, I have this passion for language. <laughs> and that's actually, I, I wanted to study language so much that at that time there weren't student loans available. And so I enlisted in the army so that I could be paid to learn a foreign language. And I did learn a, a language. I learned Russian and I ended up working as a translator for the Russians out on Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea. So <laughs> oh, I, wow. I can still swear like a fisherwoman when <laughs> necessary. But, uh, but what I found was that the, when I had been in the military, the West Point officers who I'd worked with who were trained as engineers, they had this very powerful way of problem solving. And I began to wonder, you know, is there a way that I could maybe start solving problems that way? Could I actually learn that foreign language of math and science, even though I'd flunked my way through previously? And when I got out of the military at age 26, I decided to try to retool my brain. So I had to start at uh, basically at high school level mathematics and slowly climb my way upwards and I made every mistake in the book but well one thing if I had known then what I know now oh, yeah. I could have made it so much easier and that's part of why I wrote the book was to bring in insight about how the brain really works especially when you're learning difficult subjects like math and science and technology and and make it easier and show how to learn more effectively and with less frustration. And it's very possible to do. That's fabulous. I can't wait to hear about it. So that's why you wrote the book. That was to help people learn more. Or Absolutely. easier to learn math and science. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, what's now in, the, in the regards to science, do you got a science engineering degree? I have. Well, my undergraduate is in electrical. My master's is electrical and computer. And wow. my PhD is in systems engineering. And of course, my first degree was in Slavic languages and literature. So, <laughs> but uh, between that and well, I guess part of it is I also like adventuring. So I ended up working down at the South Pole Station in Antarctica, and that's where I met my husband. So I oh. always say I had to go to the ends of the earth to meet that man, which is very <laughs> true. Uh, so I think sometimes that all these. Outside experiences, outside of academia, also help open my mind to the idea that new perspectives and new adventures are really important. But also, you that adventure of exploring areas of learning that you feel you can't do is actually a way, a powerful way of adventuring as well. So I always say, don't just follow your passions, broaden your passions. And it's so exciting what can unfold. 
Now, let me ask you a quick question. I know we're going to we got a lot of areas to cover. Um, this will encourage you to buy the book because we're not going to be able to touch everything. MOOC areas, you teach that in the Coursera. Now, does that cover the same principles as your book? Yes, okay. absolutely. Excellent. So we'll definitely cover some of those highlights. Now let's get into the nitty gritty here. <laughs> That's what everybody's waiting for. We were talking off camera. We talked about conceptualization. Right. And that was kind of the trend, I guess, in learning. And you had a really interesting view on that. Can you explain, explain that again to me, a little bit about conceptualization, why people went to it, and why it may not be the best option? We've long had this sense in math and science that if you just understand the principal idea, that if you get that glimmer of light bulb understanding, that you've got it, that that will help cement it in memory. And that's the key thing. And it turns out, though, that you can get that light bulb, ah, aha, I got it. And you know what? If you don't practice and repeat those little synoptic connections that have been made when you've got that aha will actually dissipate. They'll disappear. So this uh -huh. is what happens when you're sitting in class and you get it and then you don't look at it for a couple of days and then the test comes up and you're looking at your notes and you're like, I got it at the time, but I really can't understand what the heck that means right now. And so this is why uh, it's very, very important to not only understand, but to gain fluency, to practice and repeat. And people, they know this with relation to, let's say you're learning how to play uh, the guitar. And you know that you need to, if you just play a song once, you don't have it. You need to play it a number of times to really play it fluently, bring it to mind, and then truly be the master of it. But if we do a homework problem, you generally do it once and put it away. That's a good point. You want to do that homework problem and then put it away and see if you can do it again, maybe more quickly. And then maybe even as if you can play it in your mind like a song. If you can do that, you can't do that with everything, but if you can do that with a few of the key problems here and there, it's amazing how that will dramatically begin to help you improve in your understanding. What's the gap between that? You know, when you put it away, go back to it, put it away, is there a certain period that is more successful? Is it like two minutes, 20 minutes, an hour? That's a great question. What we found is that when you learn something and then you go to sleep at night, that is when new synoptic connections form. Mm -hmm. So there's fantastic new light microscopy images that have been uh, that have been taken that show the exact same neuron before learning and before sleep and after learning and after sleep. And you can see the new synopses forming right there. Oh, wow. So the more that you can do a little bit one day, and then uh, a little bit of learning, go to sleep, a little bit of learning, go to sleep, day after day for several days, you'll build much more concrete uh, neural structures. In other words, your learning will be deeper. And so that's why it's so important to not just wait until the very end of the week and cram everything at once. You want to do a little bit every day, and that's what can help. And uh, I think the biggest problem that people often have in learning is relates to the idea of procrastination. Oh, yeah, we talked a little bit about that. What's going on with procrastination? I think people, some people are going to be disappointed about this, especially if you're crammers. What's going on here? <laughs> well, here's the interesting point. We know from research that when you look at something you really don't want to do, for example, let's say you've got a math book and you really don't like math. When you look at it, the neural centers of your brain that are involved in pain actually light up. They have increased metabolism. You feel physical pain when you're looking at something you don't want to do or you think about something you don't want to do. And so the way to get around this it, well, what happens is you can work your way through it. After about 20 minutes or so, the pain will gradually disappear. But if you're like many people, including me, <laughs> what, what happens is there's a way you can make that pain disappear 
much more quickly. And that's simply by turning your attention to something else, which is procrastination. (laughs) And so a lot of people, they'll look at that thing they don't want to do, and then they'll switch their attention to something else, and they feel better instantly. And you do that once, you do that twice, it's not that big a deal, but you do it very often, and it it's procrastination, and it can have a very pernicious, a very bad long-term effect on your Can I ask you a quick question on that? Because it sounds like something we were talking earlier about. Can you actually strengthen your neural system in regards to procrastinating? In other words, every time you look away, every time you procrastinate, you're actually strengthening a neural system in there, in the brain, for maybe, um, oh, how would you say, to be able to avoid pain. Well, I prefer to think of it a different way. You can train your system to, uh, to, in order to strengthen your ability to stop procrastinating. Good. And, but this, don't worry. It's not something where, oh, well, then you're going to become a monomaniacal worker who <laughs> that's all you do. Because part of the way you, you strengthen that ability to focus and pay attention and actually get the work done is you only do it for very brief periods of time. And then when you're done, you relax and you enjoy that relaxation. That's actually a critical part for learning. Interesting. And and I can explain some of that. But first, let me talk about just the key, uh, most important and practically useful way of dealing with procrastination. And that is to use what's called the Pomodoro Technique. And this technique was invented by the Italian Francesco Cirillo in the 1980s. And Pomodoro is Italian for tomato. And so we did, what he did was he got this beautiful little tomato-shaped timer. And what he recommends is that you set get a timer. Really, you can get any timer. And you set it for 25 minutes. And then what you do is you turn off anything that might interrupt you. So no instant messages on your phone, right? Or you know, <laughs> nothing popping up on your computer screen. You can't, you just, you are, you focus only on what you're supposed to be focusing on, but only for 25 minutes. And virtually anyone can do 25 minutes of focused attention. I mean, at the beginning, it may seem like, oh my word, I've got 23 minutes left. I I can't do it. But if you just kind of say, no, it's okay. People have gone through and they've done it before. You'll be surprised. You can kind of, you'll get through the 25 minutes. And then when you're done, you, you relax. So what you're doing is you're practicing your ability to focus without being distracted. And then you're practicing your ability to relax. And that relax, relax process, and we haven't really talked about this, but there's two fundamental different ways that your brain operates in. And the first is what I'll just call focus mode. And that's you turn on your focus, your attention on something, and it's like, boom, like a flashlight, it's on. And then the other uh, neural set of modes is It relates to our neural resting states, and there are actually many of them. The first that was discovered by Marcus Rakel uh, and his associates of Washington University is the default mode network, and there's many other resting states that are somewhat similar. But what happens is, when you're focusing, you can solve problems that you're relatively familiar with, right? So you can go in... But if you, if there's some little twist, anything that's kind of new, you're actually, it's metaphorically, at least speaking, you're only using like a little tiny part of a pattern in your brain. And so when you get stuck, you actually need to step away and have sort of a different pattern. But how can you get to it if you're sort of only used to that pattern? The way you get to it is you actually step back and use one of these neural resting states. And that allows your thinking patterns to go much more broadly. And so that is what can allow you to get to new insights and new ways of problem solving. But to get there, you have to stop 
and not be focusing on whatever you're focusing on. And that's why after the Pomodoro technique, you got to relax a little bit. <laughs> that's extremely fascinating. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. This is incredibly engaging. We're going to take a break for a second. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time we don't even know what's wrong with us and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So we're only a phone call away. Thank you. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Barbara Oakley. We got some tough questions for her. Let's see if we can put her to the test here. So Dr. Oakley, you were talking about the Pomodoro technique. And it was a really fascinating technique, too. Um, you said 25 minutes. Are there any kind of neuroscientific studies about that 25 minutes that, that make it 25? No. All right. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting is I, I think that people don't understand how little we know about the brain. For example, even these these ideas of neural resting states are, are very recently discovered. And we, we, we know that, for example, when you blink, you momentarily seem to go into a neural resting state. But overall, what is the association, association between um, focus mode and, and default mode networks and resting states? We don't exactly know, except that we know that an alternation between them is really important, and particularly when you're problem solving. But as far as why 25 minutes, you know, it seems to work really well in a practical <laughs> sense. Some friends of mine actually go longer than that. Some friends go for an hour. Um, other friends will, well, including me. If I'm, I'm finding myself, oh, I just really am having trouble focusing on something and I don't want to do that thing, I, I'll maybe set a, a timer for 10 minutes and kind of get myself going with it, right? And an, an, I think another interesting insight that hasn't been explored from a, a research perspective is how do you get yourself going on something new that you really just don't want to do? And what I've found for myself is it often takes a few days to get myself going on tackling some new task. And if I just sort of say, okay, I'll do a Pomodoro this day that's 25 minutes, you know, for me, although different people like different times, but 25 minutes is quite common. But if I do it one day and then do it the next day, and then by the third day I'm starting to, you know, I don't, dislike this quite so much. It's uh, It seems to be a process of getting used to something. So uh, I think it's important for people to realize a lot of times that when you're first just sitting down to do something, whether it's homework or a project that you don't want to do, it, it, it often people don't like it. And, and you feel uncomfortable for those first few minutes. But if you don't think about the task itself, but instead simply on, hey, i got to put this time in, um, then it seems to go more easily. And another important mm -hmm. thing is don't focus, don't say, you know, during this time I'm sitting here, I'm actually going to finish all my homework set in these 25 minutes, or I'm going to finish all my checkbook or whatever <laughs> balancing. Don't think about completing a task. Simply think about working as intently as you can during those 25 minutes. For me, sometimes I'll, I'll say, I'm not really working as intently as I can because I'm actually thinking about whether I'm working intently. 
so I can't be working really <laughs> intently. And then I'll, I'll say, gently let those thoughts drift by. And then I'll just kind of keep working away anyway, and because that's the best you can do. <laughs> well, I got a couple more questions in regards to this. Um, you, made, you made some interesting points. Does meditation help at all in this? I mean, would it increase the ability to last longer than 25 minutes, make the 25 minutes better for you? I'm not sure how that would work here. My sense is, and I don't, uh, I'm not aware of any studies in this area, uh, because there's surprisingly few uh, studies on the Pomodoro technique, despite the fact that efficiency experts and productivity experts highly tout this technique. There's something and for dissertation students to do. There we go. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, but I, I think if you just kind of, uh, it's it's. It's just a useful technique to, to be using. And uh, I, I wish there was more by way of research that related to this kind of topic, but, you know, we just don't have right. it. Now, we got about, I think, five minutes left. What other things did you speci or, uh, focus on in the MOOC that you wanted to get out to people? I know you focused on procrastination, uh, conceptualization. Right. What else did you focus on? Well, a very interesting aspect is, let's say that you can't hold something in your short-term memory very well. For example, you were just mentioning something, and I noticed that it fell out of my short-term memory. So I was like, <laughs> mm, I don't think I've answered this as, as appropriately as I could. My short-term memory is okay, but it's not the best. I know people who can, you can give them a list of eight things and they can just rattle them all back to you. Yep. But a lot of learners, um, including me, my short-term memory isn't that great. So I can look at something and then try to remember what it was and it's gone. Uh, I can remember maybe the first thing or first couple things. And it turns out that people who have a, a short-term memory that isn't that great, they actually have a gift. The gift is that if you can't hold it in mind, other things are sneaking in instead. So something falls out, something else sneaks in, you're more creative. Interesting. And so people who huh. have to work harder because they can't keep things in mind so easily and they're, they really have to practice and practice and practice to get it into long-term memory, whereas other people can just remember it all and it easily goes into long-term memory. These, these folks who have to work more, they've got this wonderful trade-off, which is that, yeah, they have to work harder but they're more creative with, with what they've got. Interesting. And so they may, they may you know, it, it, it's frustrating. And they think, oh, I'm never as good. But they've actually got this great gift. And so I think... I haven't thought about it that way. Yeah. If, if you huh. just understand that, hey, if you've got to work harder, it probably means that you're more creative. And that's a, a trade-off well worth making. I guess so. We have a couple minutes left. I definitely want to sneak this question in. We have a fastball question for you. We'll, tell you, we'll give the ad in a little bit. Before we get to the fastball question, uh, short-term memory. You were mentioning that we used to think it was seven items that we can hold in short-term. Now it's four? More like four, yes. Four. Does it, if you have, uh, as you would say, uh, a short-term memory that maybe not as good as the average person, maybe, does that mean you have a better long-term memory? Do they have any kind of relationship whatsoever? Not that I'm aware of. In, in fact, you may need to practice longer to see your short-term memory is like this little blackboard, a holding tank, and you want to get things into your long-term memory, which is more like a warehouse. Mm -hmm. And so it, it first you got to get it into your working memory in order to be able to move it to long-term memory. So you can see if your working memory isn't that sharp, it's even harder to get things sometimes into your long-term memory. Yeah. But once you do get it there, it's there. And you can do these creative things with it that other people can't do. So uh, another thing is if you're a slower thinker, slower thinkers actually, they learn in a completely different way. And they often don't jump to conclusions the way the superstar fast thinker does. So they can actually find insights that the fast thinker completely misses. So if you're a slow thinker, uh, there's some benefits for you too. 
Interesting. Oh, we're running out of time. I wanted to ask her a question about ADHD and some of those others that might affect the way, our ability to learn. But we have to get to the fastball question. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> All right. I read something about you. Why are you called the female Indiana Jones? Oh, I think it's just because of the love of adventure and travel and doing great things and learning is actually the greatest adventure of all. And was it a name that was given to you by someone? Uh, people have called me that so often that I just was like, okay, I guess so. <laughs> we were hoping you were going to come in the hat and the whole guard, but you know, it didn't work out that way. Thank you so much. What an incredible interview. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. That was fabulous. Thank you oh, very yeah. much. You asked great questions. Oh, thank you. Um, probably all gone now. Short-term memory, they're out of there. <laughs> thank you again, Dr. Barbara Oakley. Here's her book, A Mind for Numbers. It's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. Thank you, Dr. Oakley, for being on The Circle. It's my pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, whether you remember this or not, we'll be there. And don't forget to catch Dr. Oakley on Coursera to see how, learning how to learn. Catch you next time, everyone. Mm -hmm.